Welcome to the Fiscal Philosophy YouTube channel. I consider myself to be a value-oriented investor, and today I'm going to go over the three stocks in my value portfolio that I think are currently the most underrated in the market compared to the potential value that they actually have. Now, just because I personally have these stocks doesn't make them right for anybody else necessarily, but my hope is to start a conversation around these stocks and their valuation, and hopefully somebody out there might benefit. Without much further ado, let's get into the first stock. The first company on the list is going to be PayPal. So PayPal is down over 27% year to date, down more than 80% of their all time highs of over 300 per share. And this company just does not get any love. If you look at the comment sections of any of my previous PayPal videos, they are all basically telling me it's gonna go to zero and that it's a dying business. I think the notion that PayPal is a dying business starts to fall apart pretty quickly once you pull up their revenue chart. If you look, even to this day, they continue to push revenue higher and higher. Um, it's higher today than it was when it was trading at $300 per share. And management continues to guide for revenue to go higher further into the future. So another one of these criticisms against PayPal is, oh, I never use PayPal anymore to send people money. I, I don't use PayPal checkout anymore. In fact, I don't even see it on Amazon or on any other big companies. So first of all, PayPal is way more than just PayPal. Okay, they've done a lot of different acquisitions and a lot of different strategic investments. So one service that they have is called Braintree. Braintree builds products that make payments fade into the background. You know what that means? Being in the background means they may be processing your transaction and taking their cut without you ever realizing it was PayPal to begin with, okay? So another thing is people talk about PayPal not being accepted on this or that major company. So PayPal also happens to own Venmo, okay? So people who haven't used PayPal in a while for peer-to-peer -peer, you know, transfers either on their phone or whatever, sure, yeah, they might use Apple Pay, they might use Cash App, but in you know among the people i know venmo is by far the most popular and you know what else venmo is accepted on uber and their platforms um so you know the ride share the uber eats um postmates which is also owned by uber eats and doordash which is also owned by uber eats all except venmo also um i just bought something on amazon a couple weeks ago and they also accept Venmo. So it's like people are sitting here saying, oh, you know, PayPal, you know, isn't even processing transactions on this or that major service. They are through something that they own. They own Venmo and Venmo is accepted on those platforms. So it's just I think a lot of the uh, criticism against PayPal comes from just a straight up ignorance about, um, you know, how many pies they have their hands in, so to speak. But there's also, of course, uh, the question of what PayPal is actually worth. Simply put, when it comes to valuing PayPal, I got pretty interested when it hit below $70 per share and was watching it closely. Now, today it's only at $54 per share. Um, my cost basis is right around $60, maybe slightly under. And this is using, of course, a 12.5% discount rate. The projected earnings for this year, I actually went slightly lower. And my growth projections for EPS are substantially lower than what analysts think is likely over the next few years. And even still, we get $66 as a, as a fair value. And that again, that's using a 12.5% discount rate. If you were happy with the market return, it's near $80. Again, with very conservative growth numbers. So I usually use the higher discount rate because I prefer to you know get myself a higher return. 
and I'm I'm pretty satisfied with that. Now, uh, somebody in one of my uh, comments sections said, "Hey, um, if PayPal keeps going below this moving average or whatever, it's gonna be it's gonna be thirty four dollars per share or something." So all I can say to that is, if PayPal hit thirty four dollars per share. Um, I would sell myself behind the Wendy's dumpster for more money to put into PayPal at that point because I think it would just be such a screaming deal. So the second stock on our list is Medical Properties Trust. So this stock, to say that we've experienced a little bit of pain is an understatement, okay? It's down over 60% year to date. Um, I checked this morning and it looks like 22 plus percent of the shares are sold short currently. Um, there's There was a dividend cut earlier in the year. So there's a lot of factors dragging this down right now. However, uh, on their last earnings release, a lot of the things that I felt were areas of concern were addressed in a way that I was pretty satisfied with as a shareholder. And so at this point, um, you know, I'm just looking to, you know, keep slowly but surely averaging down my cost basis while waiting for, you know, the shorts to, you know, exit their positions, the price to recover some, and for the value um, to sort of normalize in the market. Like I said before, I think the short interest is definitely pulling the share price down to an extent that's somewhat artificial. Um, a certain amount of fear is warranted on this business because of interest rates, their debt, etc. And of course, the dividend cut's going to drive out income-focused investors. But still, when you've got 22.5% short interest and almost 134 million shares sold short, that downward pressure on the stock price is going to exaggerate things. My personal opinion of the valuation of MPW is that the primary value proposition is in the assets. So a lot of people want to value it based on multiples of funds from operations, in which case you would come up with a higher valuation. I personally think it's worth somewhere between $13 and $14 per share today based on the book value per share. Management has indicated that they've received credible offers on several of their assets, so I think it's reasonable to assume that they could turn some of their assets into liquid cash if they needed to at values that are relatively close to book value. So the final stock on today's list is Paramount Global. This stock has fallen over 30% year to date, and it's down over 50% since Berkshire bought in. Um, based on the timing, it would seem like their basis would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 or low 30s. And it has done nothing but drop since then. Now, analysts at Bank of America uh, recently downgraded their uh, price target on this from $32 to $9, which I think is sheer Bozo the Clown silliness, but we'll get into that in just a moment. Also, before we get to the end here, make sure that you write the like button's name in the death note, and make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell to never miss another video. So, Paramount is another one of these companies that I think the true value is somewhere in their brands and their assets more than anything else, okay? So not only do they have, you know, classic Paramount Pictures, uh, the old Viacom uh, content from Nickelodeon, MTV, uh, Comedy Central and the like, but they've also got the streaming with Paramount Plus, okay, and Pluto TV, as well as they own the Showtime network, um, they have, you know, live sports and so much else. And I sit here wondering, okay, Netflix has a market cap of nearly $200 billion, okay? Something like that. Um, and we're sitting here on Paramount with a market cap of like just under $8 billion. So I, I'm just sitting here asking myself, okay, 
What length of time and what monetary cost would it take for a company like Netflix or you know Prime Video or Apple TV or any of those other companies to come up with the amount of content, both in terms of quantity and quality that we have on Paramount? Um, now, they have this really, really deep library and they're only really just starting to hit their stride with streaming, okay? So I think when it comes to Paramount, there's something to this valuation um, and it's it just seems cheap on the face of it. When it comes to valuing Paramount, I personally wouldn't go strictly off book value since there's so much goodwill and intangibles on this balance sheet. However, I think it is interesting to note that Berkshire paid very close to this amount. Um, I also like to factor in you know, a DCF model to take a look at what their future earnings potential would be like and factor that into my own valuation. So when it comes to valuing Paramount based on their future earnings potential, um, I think it's fairly reasonable to assume that they can get back to the $2 per share level of earnings. They've previously performed much better than this. and. I think in the next few years, even the analysts say that, you know, they'll actually get above this level. Um, I think, though, assuming they get there is pretty conservative. And then assuming after they achieve that low growth numbers like inflation or lower. All right. For the long term and apply a 12 and percent discount rate, give them credit for their tangible book value. And granted, this is a severely discounted number when it comes to um, the assets because there is so much uh, intangibles and goodwill. And to say that those have no value whatsoever, uh, I don't necessarily believe that when it comes to Paramount, but I sit here and I come up with about a $20 level and my whole, uh, you know, intent with this was to just start getting in below $20. And um, yeah, my cost basis is actually substantially below $20. I think it's, it's closer to the mid teens. And, you know, this is, I think, less than half of where Berkshire got in. So, you know, if I can pick up something like this at a level that's so much cheaper than where Berkshire got it, well, I feel pretty good about that, um, regardless of what uh, you know any Bank of America analyst might say. Just for fun, I also threw this into the Everything Money Stock Analyzer tool, and you can see that my middle assumption for multiples of cash flow actually came out to a pretty similar level to what I got um, in my Guru Focus DCF calculator. I would like you guys, if you are familiar with this tool, to maybe try to guess what my assumptions were. Thanks again for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you remember to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, do the notification bell, join us on Discord, link in the description. Also blow up my comment section like Frieza blew up Planet Vegeta. and. Make sure that you consider becoming a channel member and help support my great work. Take it easy, everyone.